Uh, Satya will. Oh, okay, perfect. Some are already pressed recording. Um, we'll uh, give an overview on the new advances in LLP with a focus on transformers and attention. And it will actually build also on this previous uh, great presentation on sequence to sequence models. So I hand it over to you. Satya. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, welcome everyone. So let me just share my screen. Right, so today's uh, topic is basically about attention and transformers. So with a particular focus uh, on the recent advancements in NLP that has been going on. So attention has been in the literature and it has basically like uh, blasted on the seat, like just came out out of nowhere and it has like grabbed everyone's attention. And now it's being used in almost like all of the state of the art architectures. And this has not just been constrained to language. So now it has been applied, it is being applied in the image domain as well. So we'll take a look at all that. So the paper that I'll be focusing on is attention is all you need, very aptly titled. And you'll see why attention is all you need and, and we can do away with all the convolution and recurrent architectures essentially. So moving on. So the contents basically what we'll be covering is, so I'll just give a brief recap. So as David mentioned, this builds on the previous reading sessions uh, topic, which was on seek to seek models, which is nothing but sequence to sequence, which we'll briefly talk about. And then I'll go through the background where I'll talk about certain things which are used in the transformers architecture. So we'll just briefly take a look into these things, which includes residual connections, then attention itself, then soft and hard attention and self attention. And then we'll move on to transformers where we'll talk about the abstract and then we'll move on to the motivation behind this particular architecture and then how this attention mechanism within the context of transformer works and how the authors went about training this model and ultimately the evaluation. So moving on, so very briefly, let's recap a few things. So we know that for sequence modeling, the state of the art has been for a long time, uh, the recurrent neural networks. So recurrent neural networks are just a slight modification to the classic feed forward neural network where we have layers and then we have certain ways attached between every layer. So the only difference in RNNs is that it has a recurrence built into it. And this recurrence is nothing, but it's a feedback loop where basically it allows the network to retain a sort of memory. So basically what happens is, so this is basically just like a standard feed forward network. You give an input X, it goes into this black box, let's call it, and then an output, it spits out output. But in this case, what happens is it process, uh, processes a uh, sequence in a time in a yeah, like an auto regressive manner. So like at every time step, you will see it uh, processes a particular token or a particular unit in that sequence. So for example, if it's a sentence, so it'll process one token at a time. So it's a very sequential uh, form of this, this particular processing. So basically what happens is I give the input at time t minus one. So that goes into this particular model. And then it somehow uh, creates this internal representation, which we call it as the hidden state. And this hidden state then is used along with the next input. And then it um, gives an output at time uh, t. So basically the hidden state gets carried forward from every time step. And the subsequent tokens that are being fed gets this context vector. So the hidden state is also known as the context vector. So basically what we are doing is we're trying to capture the context of everything that has come before. So at time t, so all the different tokens that I process at time t minus one, t minus two. So I'm basically trying to somehow compress that and encode that information into the small two-dimensional vector. So this is, this is what gave RNNs its power. So it, in a way, it, you can term it as the memory of the network. So basically what happens is if there is a sentence called what time is it? So this is from my uh, previous presentation. So what goes in, it gives an output and also captures the, the latent vector, the hidden state. And the hidden state is passed on to the next 
time step and the next token is fed in and so forth. So what you see here, these colors, they represent the percentage of gradients. So by gradients, we mean that when there's a up beta update that happens in a neural network. So the gradients play a large role because it's the amount by which the weights are updated. So if the gradients are very big, the weight update happens very rapidly, whereas if it's like very small, it barely learns anything. So the one of the core problems with RNN was they cannot retain long range dependencies. So long range dependencies, meaning that if I'm processing this question mark here, it will, by that time, it would have almost forgotten about this token, which is represented here with this very small slice, as you can see. So every color represents that particular token. And the context that has been captured is only for this question mark. So this, is, this creates a lot of problem because we want to retain the context of the tokens that came previously, as much as like the token that we are processing at this point in time. So this was one of the fundamental flaws with RNNs. So to address this, then, uh, yeah, then people came up with this very special network called LSTM, which is which stands for long short-term memory. So long short-term memory targeted this particular problem and it tried to fix it by introducing a very um, how should I put it? it? It's it's yeah, it has a complicated machinery. So basically, what you see here is just a standard recurrent neural network. It's the same diagram from before, but represented in a slightly different way. So at time t minus one, I'm processing an input. It gives me a hidden state, which again I pass it to the next time step and so forth. But apart from all this, and as you can see, there is a tan h here, which is nothing but a nonlinear function, which which uh, ultimately gives power to neural networks to be able to map these very highly nonlinear functions. So that's like the very simple form of the RNN. But instead of that, what LSTMs do is introduces these three gates, which is a forget gate, input gate, and output gate. And as you can see, as the name suggests, the forget gate, what, it, what it's responsible for is to forget certain aspects of the input it already saw before. So for example, if I'm, if I'm talking about a particular person and this person happened to be a male and as the sequence is being processed if i encounter another person which is the uh, the other subject in this particular sentence and that person happens to be a female now i have to change the pronouns so i have to forget the pronouns for the man which is a he for example so and i have to retain the pronoun in context to this new subject so for things like that this forget gives forget gate comes into the picture so by doing these control gate operations we can choose to retain the most critical information that is required for this particular sequence based on what we want to predict next. So that, uh, so this basically gave power to the LSTMs. And in a nutshell, it gave them the ability to retain long range dependencies. And here long range dependencies means the token that we are processing and the distance of that token from, the, from all the other tokens which came before. So if I have a very large sentence, so the first token and the last token, so I'll call them to, uh, I'll turn them to have a very long range dependencies. Whereas a token which just came before, that would have a very short uh, yeah, range dependencies. So this is where LSTMs were uh, very beneficial. Then came along sequence to sequence models, which is nothing but so, so basically what sequence to sequence model does is it takes one sequence of arbitrary length. So the length is immaterial here and it, uh, feeds it in, into this model. Uh, let's just uh, view it as a black box for now. And it spits out another variable length output. So both the input, the dimensions of the input and the dimensions of the output do not have to be the same. Uh, so this gave uh, it a very, um, uh, like a very powerful ability to process sequences which were like of different lengths. So the very natural case for this to be applied was then to uh, language translation. So for example, a language, uh, the input sentence in English will not exactly have the same number of words in French, say for example, or German. So they will have a slightly different uh, number of tokens. So sequence to sequence model basically took that, as you can see here. So it had basically two components, which is the encoder and the decoder. And here, as you can see, she is eating a green apple. And this gets processed sequentially and it outputs this. Um, yeah, it outputs a sentence in the target language, which happens to be Chinese in this case. And as you can see, there is the notion of the context vector here, which is nothing, but it's capturing this variable length string to a fixed size vector 
which then we remap back to another variable size uh, output. So the core idea here was that given two arbitrary length string of dimensions, say the input being M and the output being N, if we just convert this uh, input uh, string to a low dimensional vector of fixed length and then project it back to N dimensions, so that potentially can help us uh, overcome this problem of like mapping between two different uh, strings of different dimensions. And Google Translate has been using six sig models in production. So basically when we talk to Google Assistant, so it's probably most probably running sig to sig models in the background. So now they have done a few iterations, so it's definitely gotten better. So this is basically the architecture of sig to sig So yeah, in a nutshell, it just has an encoder, which encodes this source sentence into a fixed length vector. And it has a decoder, which then remaps back uh, this, this particular latent vector onto the output target uh, language. Another, just very briefly, another thing uh, I'd like to- Can I just to... ask one mini thing? Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Um, punctuation, mm -hmm. which, which role does it play? Like, um, does it reset at the beginning of a new sentence? Or it also needs to have memory about, um, I met Satya, he, mm -hmm. and then the he is Satya. Uh, it needs to memorize that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, so that's that's where like the, these LSTMs really excel because then based on like these forget gates that I mentioned, so what it can do is it can then selectively focus on like me, the new subject. So then it highlights things like he, because in our training sample, uh, when the subject appears with a he, so like when the subject appears and there is a he, in front of it or after it. So then it kind of gives this uh, model a sense of like, this would be the pronoun, which is associated with the subject and so forth. And with regards to punctuation, they are important as well because they signify a critical moment, I guess, in the sentence, like uh, full stops are very, very discriminative in the sense that they definitely occur at the end of a sentence and then you are starting something new. So it kind of like captures that information or if it's a comma, then there is definitely some kind of segregation between this earlier part before this punctuation and after. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. So yeah, so moving on. Yeah, so, so something very briefly I'll, I'd like to talk about is, so because we are talking about translation, so translation is just one thing we are focusing on because most of these models were born out of translation because translation is such a hard problem to solve that if, like, if, you, if someone solves it, along the way, a lot of other problems get solved as well. So, so how do we evaluate translation basically is one of the questions. So we use something called BLUE, which is nothing but the bilingual evaluation under study. So bilingual meaning that there are two languages involved, the source sentence and the target sentence. And uh, yeah, and basically that's what it uh, encapsulates. So it's very briefly what it means is, so it counts the matching n-grams. So n-gram is nothing but if it's a unigram, it's a single token. If it's a bigram, there are two tokens that we take together, trigrams and so forth. So it counts the matching n-grams between a candidate translation and the reference translation. So the reference translation is nothing but the gold standard, uh, yeah, which like everyone agrees on, it's the ground truth. So hence a perfect match would result in a score of one. So if I'm translating uh, from a source sentence and every token that I translated happened to match with the reference uh, translation, then I get a perfect score of one. Whereas a perfect mismatch would be zero and anything in between would have a score between zero and one. And then we can weight different um, unigrams, bigrams differently. Like if I want to place importance on bigrams so I can place a higher weight on them, I can multiply them and then add all the tokens together. So one very key thing to, I guess, uh, note here is that even the best human translators have scored like 0.34 against four references and scored like 0.25 against two references on a test corpus of 500 sentences. So it's an extremely hard thing to, like translation is very hard. And this, it doesn't help that this particular evaluate, evaluation metric uh, heavily relies on like one-to-one -one matching. So it's not, a, it's not fuzzy matching here. It's like one-to-one -one matching of exact token that has been produced in our uh, target language. So as, as an example, uh, so this reference translation, so this is the gold standard here, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So suppose I'm 
um, translating from French or um, Japanese or something. And this happened to be my English translation. So then to, uh, the candidate translations that I have are in these cases, case one, two, and three. So the first case is the fast brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So instead of quick, I replace that with fast and immediately the blue score decreased to 0.75 and so forth. As you can see, I replace fast and sleepy uh, with, uh, I replace quick and lazy with fast and sleepy and the blue score straight away goes down, even though it kind of conveys the same meaning. So for humans, it's quite, uh, easy because we, we can somehow appreciate the fuzziness or we know that this lies in the vicinity of this particular word like it captures the meaning sufficiently that we can get away with saying this is would be a approximate translation but for a computer um, that simply doesn't work and blue like heavily penalizes so it instantly reduces point for it hence these scores that you see here uh, yeah they are uh, that's that's how they came up with that um, so yeah, blue can be used for any text generation task as long as we have some uh, reference text. So again, reference text meaning the, the gold standard basically with which we'll be comparing. So moving on. So now just let's take a brief look at some of the background uh, that is, I guess, needed to understand a few things. So one of the things that uh, transformers, which we'll take a look briefly, um, they implement is something called residual connections. So in a simple neural network, what happens is if I give an input X to a, a layer, which is uh, which has all the, like the connections have all the weights, and then this layer basically have all the units, which are also the neurons, and then you have different layers stacked together. So what happens is the input passes through this layer, and then it passes to the next layer, and so forth. So the transformed input basically gets propagated across the different layers. But what residual or skip connections propose is basically to take this input and one, uh, it does go through the layers one by one, but then there is another pathway which links this input and allows it to skip over these layers and straight away go and meet at this output, which is the, uh, which is the uh, output which comes out of the subsequent layer here and it directly concatenates that with the output that comes out of this weight layer. So you can see this, if this is f of x, which is the transformation being applied to the input and a long linearity such as Frehley, which is like a, which is nothing but a tan h or a sigmoid. It's just a non-linearity, which is uh, either says your, um, uh, the neuron either fires or doesn't fire. So it's the activity basically. So if it's f of x here, then I take x and directly add it to uh, the f of x, as you can see here. It's quite clear. So this is a very simple thing. It's a very, it's all, almost trivial uh, when we look at it now, but uh, this allowed people to like uh, dramatically raise the performance in, in networks. And basically what we are doing is we are applying an identity function, which just takes X and yeah, this doesn't do any transformation. It just returns it back as it is. So they are basically information superhighways that allow input to directly flow to the next layer, as I mentioned. And they were first used in ResNets, as the name suggests, which were in the residual networks where, uh, so this came out of uh, Microsoft research where they applied this to uh, image classification tasks and this dramatically improved the performance. So what they al allow is they allow for uninterrupted gradient flow from this layer. Say for example, it allows the gradient to flow directly. And even when we do back propagation, it can that propagate, propagate errors directly without having to go through here. So one of the pathways do go through here, but it also allows us to completely skip these layers. And this tackles the problem, uh, a problem, which is uh, the vanishing gradient problem. So basically in vanishing gradient, what happens is if, if I take a gradient, the derivative, and if it tends to be very small, and because I'm doing weight updates, if the derivative is extremely small, then it does not really, uh, it does not really update the weight as much, so it's not learning. So we say that a network is learning only when the weights are sufficiently being uh, changed. But if the gradient is extremely small, it does not get subtracted from the previous weight as much because the weight is just quite low. And as a result, uh, the learning fades. So to counter these things, we can directly plug this in. So that's one of the, the concepts that we're using here. Now let's talk about attention. So um, yeah, like in nature language, like in our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, circumstances, like attention basically means that we focus on one particular thing. So given a bigger picture, we are able to focus at a very, at a very small set of, um, like a subsample of that space, let's call it. 
So for example, in case of uh, visual processing, what happens is if we look at any scene, so our uh, eyes directly go to uh, some very specific features, like it tries to pick up some very specific features. So we see this like high, we see things in high resolution where our attention is focused and everything else is kind of in low resolution, as you can see here. This kind of like roughly, uh, it's mimicking what, what actually goes on in the human mind. But basically this is the gist of it. So, so it's like we're targeting things which are really necessary and kind of ignoring the rest, not completely ignoring, but, but uh, giving a certain level of importance to, uh, to a subsample of that, of that entire space. So that's the basic idea of attention. And this is what the, the authors actually uh, use. So moving on. So attention then in deep learning basically becomes a vector of important weights. So again, like every, like as everything in, in machine and deep learning, everything is a vector. So attention in this case is also a vector, but this vector basically has these weights, which are nothing but uh, they are encapsulating how much importance is to be given to certain things. So for example, say if we want to predict or infer an element, uh, this element can be a pixel if we are talking about images or a word if we are talking about sentences or, or a corpus then we estimate how it attends to other elements. So what, what basically this means, if you can see this picture here, there's a, this, this dog, uh, Shiba Inu. So, so like if, if we were to attend to this picture, like if I was to classify this picture to be a dog, what are the features that, that I'll focus on? So I won't focus on the background, right? Like this background has nothing to do with this thing being classified as a dog. So basically what I'll need to focus is on features like its ear, its eyes maybe, and its nose, and maybe all of them appearing in a single context. So the ear by itself has no meaning, but it has to appear in relative proximity with the eyes and the nose. And the nose, uh, I mean, it could be a human nose, but in this case, it's a dog's nose. So the network has to somehow encode this information and understand that it needs to attend to these particular features, the features of a dog, in order to be able to classify this image. So that's what we mean by attention basically. So what we can do is we can take a weighted sum, just a simple dot product with the attention vector. So I have this vector of uh, different weights, which is not, which is telling me where I need to put my attention. And yeah, and by, uh, and by like simply taking a dot product, we can have an approximation of where we, of the regions that we want to put our attention to. So that's how it translates to images, but you can also see it translates to text as well. So if I have a sentence, she's eating a green apple, so the, by the moment I look at the word eating, green maybe is not as important a uh, word. Like if, if eating is my current word and I want to attend to uh, all the other words in the same sentence, so I'd probably go with apple because eating and apple seem to have a more stronger relation and, and we need to at, uh, attend to the, the token apple rather than the token green. But if I shift my window to green, if I just consider green, then eating green is, doesn't really make sense. So in that case, it's probably going to be Apple. So this is how the, the attention shifts depending on which token we are talking about. So uh, very briefly, we talk about soft and hard attention. So soft attention is nothing but, it's also known as the global attention, but it's, it's nothing. But when we apply the attention continuously over the entire input space, so we're not taking a specific region in, in, in this, in our input see, and the input can be images or sentences or the entire corpus, but we're applying it over the entire region and we are finding probabilities of where the attention needs to be focused. So regions with high probability of attention uh, that for that particular context window, it'll, it'll assign more importance there, say for example. And you can see it here. So the, if I just give this prompt, a woman is throwing a Frisbee in a park, in the park. So basically what, what is happening here? So this came out of a paper where they tried to, uh, where they tried to generate, uh, automatically generate captions given an image. So this image was given and this is what the model came up with. So it produced this caption automatically. So, and when they tried to interpret the model, what they basically saw is, as you can see, every picture has a token assigned to it. So a woman is throwing a Frisbee in a park. So at every, uh, step of this process when a appeared so the neurons get got activated here which doesn't really tell us much but when woman got appear uh, woman appeared it 
got activated in these two regions. Now it kind of understands that it's a person because this child and this woman have relatively similar features, like they're both humans um, in contrast to the background, say for example. That is, is not really giving us much information. Throwing, okay, A again, Frisbee. Now when the moment it came to Frisbee, as you can see, it's straight away kind of tries to capture that this could be a Frisbee. So the neurons here are getting the most activated in a park. And park is interesting as well because it kind of is highlighting the background. So, so the, uh, the region which is appearing lighter is the region of higher activity in this case. So you can clearly see that it's understanding what park is and at least like what a woman or a human kind of looks like. So that's what we mean by soft attention. Soft attention are differentiable because they're continuous, uh, and but they're computationally closely, as, as one can imagine. Like if I'm taking the entire image and if it's like in megapixels, you know, like thousand by thousand pixels, it's, it's uh, computationally expensive. Whereas there's another variant called hard or local attention, which is nothing but I select a region in this particular input space and I focus my attention there. And as you can imagine, this is much more discrete. So, it's inexpensive because I'm only selecting a region of the entire input space, but it's not uh, non-differentiable. So being differentiable in deep learning has a lot of benefits because then we can take the derivatives and we can do backdrop and stuff like that. And when things are not differentiable, then we have to resort to certain tricks and yeah, which I won't cover here, but yeah, it becomes uh, relatively difficult in that case. Then another concept is self-attention. Now we, we took a look at attention, which is um, yeah, which like captures this notion of how we humans attend to things. Now, what is self-attention? So it's also known as inter-attention, and it relates to different positions of a single sequence to produce a representation of the same sequence. So, like in translation, generally we have a source and a target sentence, but here we are not talking about the target sentence. I'm just taking one sequence, and I'm asking which uh, given these tokens, what, what is the correlation of these tokens with the other tokens in the same sentence? So this is generally used for machine reading and it enables the model, model to learn the correlation between the current word and the previous part of the sentence. So here you can see, it's a very nice example. So th the token in red is the one which is getting uh, processed at, at this particular time. So the FBI is chasing a criminal on the run. So when the came, so there was no context. So you know, nothing got activated. And the blue region and the intensity of blue is basically telling us how active the model was, when, how sensitive the model was when this particular token was being processed. So when FBI was selected, so the, uh, naturally, because that's the only token it has seen so far, it got activated. Then similarly, we keep on uh, processing and you can see that by the time it has finished processing the entire sentence, it kind of understood that chasing criminal and run are probably the most, um, yeah, probably the, the tokens or the, or the elements of the sentence that needs the most attention in context to the sentence because chasing a criminal who is on the run is, is yeah, like these three tokens kind of, uh, you know, uh, capture this context. So this is what we mean by self-attention. It's a very, it's a very, again, like a trivial idea, I think, like thinking in hindsight, but when it came out, like, yeah, it kind of added a lot of um, uh, information in, in a way to the model so that it's better able to discern which parts of the input it really needs to focus on and which parts things like is a on. I mean, we can do a simple stopword removal, but like generally what in deep learning, at least what we tend to do is like do minimal feature engineering. So we are not removing stop words at all, but rather allowing the model to learn that these are stop words and by virtue of that, they are not as important or as discriminative as these other uh, more uh, yeah, powerful tokens. So just a visualization of the same. So if I take another quote, so the an <clears throat> sorry, the animal didn't cross the street as it was too tired. Now we as human, uh, if we ask, what does it refer to here? So we know it refers to the animal and not the street but it's again not easy for the computer to um, yeah like discern so once the model is trained what we can do is we can see uh, based on what token i select which were the other elements or tokens in the same sentence that were getting activated so if 
once the model has been trained, so this is after the model has been trained, if I go and select it, so basically it gets activated. So the strength of the self-attention is uh, designated by this particular thickness of this uh, line that you see. So it gets most activated with the animal. So the model somehow understands that it is not talking about the stream, but rather the animal. So this is the power of self-attention. Similarly, another example. So in this example, so this is talking about uh, laws in 2019, making the registration of voting process more difficult. So when it goes and selects making, like you can do this for any of the other tokens, but in this case, we're just highlighting, like when I'm selecting making, say for example. So what the model then attends to, what the model then goes and like says, oh, what other tokens are important with respect to making is more difficult, which makes, like, makes total sense. So yeah, it's just another example to highlight. Now let's move on to transformers, which is, I guess, the key topic of um, today. So this paper, which is, uh, which is titled Transformers All You Need. So basically, attention has been applied in other domains. Like, um, it has been applied in context to translation before as well. But they, this is one paper where they combine self-attention and a few novel things that we'll take a look. And it really shined there because what basically it did is it completely did away with like recurrent uh, architectures or convolution architecture because generally the status quo um, till then was that if I'm working with images, I'll choose a convolutional architecture because they have strong priors. So by that, by that I mean like convolutional networks have been built in order to process images because uh, with respect to images, a lot of um, like the pixel space that we have, like pixels that correspond to certain features in images tend to be around a neighborhood. So a lot of architectural design that went into building these convolutional networks took that into account. So it's a strong, it has a strong prior, it has a strong bias for images. Similarly with recurrent neural networks, it's more suited for processing sequences as we know, because it kind of retains this memory as it's like, processing sequences time step by time step. But transformers basically, it has given us a unified platform which can not only process images, but it can process sequences. And like the goal of uh, all these architectures ha have been to push towards this unified framework so that we don't have multiple architectures doing, uh, you know, suited for different domains, but rather one single master architecture which can solve all the problems. So transformer is definitely a step in that direction. So let's take a look at the abstract. So the dominant sequence transaction transduction model, which is nothing but translation model, are based on complex recurrent or convolutional networks, as I mentioned. Now. Um, yeah. So yeah, basically, I guess I I, uh, I mentioned that already. So one key thing to see is uh, WMT14, which is nothing but it's the name of, of this data set where. Uh, it's a parallel corpus, which just means that it has the source sentences and the target sentences in in I, in the source language and the uh, target language. So it has it's it comes in two variants. One is English to French and English to German. And blue, as I already mentioned before, just the evaluation score by how well this is performing the translation. So transformers basically achieve a twenty eight point four blue score on the English to German translation task, and uh, yeah, and it achieves 41.8 on English to French. So the English to German, it achieves by over two blue scores, which is uh, uh, on top of the previous uh, state of the art, which is like an ensemble of different models and so forth. And it achieves it in uh, 3.5 days on each GPU. So this is a, yeah, it requires quite heavy computation, but I think now it has become quite simplified. So this was when it came out back in 2017. So let's move on. So the motivation, so as, as we discussed, uh, the problems of recurrent neural networks were overcome by LSTMs. And then we had uh, sequence to sequence models which then built on these LSTMs. But now the key motivation of transformer is that inherently sequential, sequential nature precludes parallelization within training examples. So what they are trying to basically highlight is whenever it comes to processing sequences, generally they are hard to parallelize and par parallelizing things was one of the very important aspects because we want to get greater training speeds and we want to have faster inferences. So parallelization helps a lot in this, in this context. 
and uh, what sequence learning problems generally have like they have been formulated in a way where like we had to process one sequence at a time so we couldn't parallelize them so this is one of the biggest bottlenecks to like training recurrent recurrent networks in general so they are hard to train and fixed length encoding sets a bottleneck on the memory for long sequences so as we take took a look in the sequence and uh, sequence to sequence models so I have a variable length string. Then I project this into a fixed length uh, vector, but the size of this vector, no matter what size I choose, is ultimately going to set an upper bound. So it's still going to be limited by this bottleneck that, that exists. And beyond a certain threshold, it will not be able to retain uh, the context or you know, retain certain information about things that have come before. So true that LSTMs are able to map long-term dependencies, but then it does have like a, upper bound to how much can it retain. So if my sequences are extremely long, then there's a chance that it'll probably forget by the time it comes to the last uh, token, it'll probably forget the, yeah, the hundredth previous token or something like that. So instead of obtaining a single context vector out of the encoder's last hidden state, which is what sig to sig model does, which I, I guess I discussed in, in the last uh, session, so here what it does is it takes the last hidden state of the encoder. So by doing that, what I'm basically saying is I'm giving more importance to the later part of the sentence than the earlier part, because it's just taking the last hidden state. And as we already saw in the diagram previously, the gradient proportion is, so it's disproportionate. So it gives more importance to the things that came later. So we do away with this completely. So by implementing attention, so we can create shortcuts between the context vector and the entire source input. So rather than having to rely on this last state, which is giving high importance to this later part of the sentence, we build these shortcuts from the, from the target sentence to the original input sentence in, a, in such a way that at any given time, the decoder part of the network can choose to look at any part of the input and not just the last token. So that has like uh, big uh, ramifications. So we'll take a look at that. Now transformer a model architecture eschewing reference and instead relying on attention mechanism to do, draw global dependencies between input and output. So this is what I just mentioned before. So here, rather than talking about long-term dependencies, they are even like uh, pushing that further by talking about global dependencies. So it's capturing like the global uh, context of the entire sentences or entire chunks of images or whatever sequential data we are feeding. So, okay, so this diagram is a, it looks a little complicated, but uh, stay with me. Uh, so in the architecture, basically, it again has an encoder and decoder, as is common with, with most uh, language uh, neural translation models. So the encoder, so this particular part is the encoder, as you can see here, and this second part is the decoder. So what basically happens is, so in encoder, it has this, unit. So this is one unit of this encoder and transformers basically implement six of these. So there are six of them present. So here we are just showcasing. Them. Now, basically what happens is once I put the inputs, so the inputs are not in major language because the very first thing we need to do is convert uh, num uh, words, alphabets into, into numeric representations, which is done by Wartovic and uh, other uh, like embedding uh, yeah, algorithms. So basically we get this word embedding and then we feed this word embedding to something called pos positional encoding uh, scheme. So positional encoding, basically what it does is, sorry. So it tries to encode the information about the position of the tokens. So things which came later. So it tries to encode the tokens which came later and uh, like it tries to encode the information about its position. So so information, uh, the, the position of the tokens is plays a very important role. So we don't want a bag of words model where it completely loses the order and so forth. So we don't still want to be able to retain that position. So we use positional encoding and they use sinusoidal uh, functions for this. And that's another, like, it's a, yeah, it, it uh, there's certain motivations for that because like using sinusoids, what we have is like different amplitudes. So we can somehow superimpose these amplitudes and try to find at which particular point they are more likely to occur. So this is the one of the motivations they gave. And once we convert that, basically we pass it to this layer and we'll talk about them separately. So this is called the multi-head attention. So this is one attention layer applied many times. So, this, so it, one of the connections goes there. 
Another one you can see here, which if you can recall, is nothing but the skip connection. So it directly skips all this and directly goes and adds to the output of this multi-head attention. And uh, it's normalized by softmax. And then that gets paired onto the feed forward network. So this is a standard feed forward neural network. And there's another skip connection uh, implemented there. And again, it's added to the output of this feed forward uh, network and normalized. And that again goes and feeds here. So while this is happening, uh, parallelly, so th this is not sequential anymore. It's like happening parallelly. So as I'm passing my inputs, I'm also passing my target. So this is my source sentence. This is my target sentence. So again, I do the same thing, positional encoding, and I do the exact same operations as I did here. But then there's another additional attention layer where the output of this, again, there's a skip layer here. Output of this goes into a second attention layer. So the so the main difference here is that once I did these two operations, which are similar, this particular attention layer takes the decoder's um, encoding in a way, and it also takes the encoding that is coming from the encoder, and it concatenates them together, and it feeds this to this uh, additional attention layer. And then similarly, we have another feed forward, and then add, uh, add in normalization. And at the end, I just have a head for classification, like logistic regression or something, and I have the softmax probabilities. So basically, there is a recurring motif here, which is like this this basic unit, which is getting repeated. If you can see, so as you can see, this, it, there's a pattern there. So this basically, what it basically does is it encodes, like it uh, allows self attention to emerge in in the encoder as well as in the decoder in parallel, and capture the context within the source in the target sentence, and then it mixes those two contexts in this particular unit here, and which I then feed to this uh, standard feed forward method. So this is what basically they're doing, and this is what they're explaining here, and we have six of these happening at the same time. So this, yeah, this is the basic architecture of, of transformers. So yeah, like just to recap, I guess. So encoder, decoder, deco encoding and decoding all happens at once. So no recurrence. So there is no recurrence here. So we are not like maintaining a hidden state at one time step and then another time step, I'm just passing it along. So that's not happening. It's all happening at once, which lends it a very nice uh, parallelizable ability. And this basically works wonders on, on GPU and it's able to like scale up in terms of training, training time and so forth. So positional encoding, as I mentioned, so it retains the order and sequencing. So did it appear in the beginning and and so forth? So all these small questions, like did this token appear in the beginning or did this was it in the middle and so forth? So these are like encoded using these positional en uh, encodings and trigonometric functions are generally used for this, like sinusoidal. The word vectors that get through the encoder and decoder looks at the um, looks at the input directly where then attention comes into the picture, where the decoder looks at. So after encoding this with these attention layers, basically we are asking the decoder to take a look at what the encoder produces. So, and, and, and in essence, allow it to like focus on a certain part of the sentence if it wants to, so which emerges from the training of the network. So then uh, this, yeah, so we'll talk about this shortly. So there is something they implement here, which is the addressing scheme. So this is also used in neural Turing machine, so um, don't have to worry about that. So, but basically what it does is it outputs a bunch of keys. So imagine I have a key from K1 to Kn, a set of keys. And these keys are nothing but it, they're the indexes to the hidden states. So like hidden states that we have in RNN are pretty like straightforward. We, we have it there. but here, what they chose to do is they, they are using a scheme to address, to like assign indexes to these different hidden states, and they're calling these addresses K1, K2, just like how a computer assigns uh, memory to a variable. When we declare a variable, it goes and you know gets stored in a particular location, but it, it has an address to that and so forth. So that's what this particular addressing scheme is used to. So then the decoder can choose to attend to these inputs, as I mentioned before, and it outputs the probabilities here at every step, uh, and every step is one training sample. So there's no multi-step backpropagation taking place. So, and as I mentioned, so attention is basically applied in three different places. So once here, uh, for a second time it's applied here, and the third time it's applied there. So that's the overall architecture. 
uh, yeah, then there's something they apply called the scale dot product. So this is what the core of attention here is. Like we've been talking about attention in terms of how we pay attention and so forth, but but the like the core uh, mechanic here is that it's a it's nothing but a scale dot product. And we'll take a look how how it's just a simple dot product that allows the decoder to attend to or like focus on certain parts of the sentence. So this is the basic formula for the attention. So it's a softmax. So softmax is nothing but it just normalizes um, uh, a set of numbers uh, to be probabilities between zero and one. And if you add all those up, it uh, outputs uh, it equals to one. So I have the query, the keys, and the values here. So let's just define three things here: the queries, keys, and the values, and we'll talk about it in the next slide. So if I pass these three things to the attention function, basically. What it does is it takes the softmax by taking a dot product of the query with the keys and it divides by this uh, square root of dk. So dk here is nothing but a dimension of the keys. So if I have 100 keys, so that would be 100, like square root of 100. So they do this in order to scale it. So it has no other purpose than to rescale the output basically because they observe, I think, like if the number of keys are uh, larger then there are certain unintended effects. So in order to scale all of them to, be, to have the same effects, they basically divide it by the square root of uh, the number of the dimensions of the keys. So we take a softmax over this, which will give me a probability, and then we multiply it by the value. So we'll take a look why we do this. So in a more schematic way, you can see here, so I feed a key and a query, which is these two, and I do a matrix multiplication, which is the dot product here. Then I scale it, which is nothing but the division by this square root of the dimensions of the key. And then I do masking operations, which we don't really need to concern here. With. And then I do a softmax, which is this particular function. And then I again multiply with the value here, which is outside. So this is basically what the entire attention mechanism is. Now just let's understand what actually this means. So so we know that we can project vectors in, in a vector space, right? Like if I have, if I have vectors um, representing certain attributes or like even words, we can project words uh, using their word vectors. So just imagine all the keys, queries, and values to be vectors. So they're not uh, a single discrete number, but rather they're, they're vectors. So then what I can do is I can project the keys into this vector space. So I have the key K1 being projected here, K2, K3, and K4, and so forth. Then if I introduce a query, which is this, which is nothing but another vector, what I can then do is I can check for similarity between keys. So if I just do a dot product, and it's very similar to the cosine similarity, except that it takes the magnitude into account as well. So if I just introduce this query here and just ask myself like what is the closest key that that i can see here i mean it's pretty clear it's k2 here so then what happens is basically that i select the value corresponding to k2 so i'll go up and use this lookup table here and then select this particular value k2 so this is basically what's happening so i'm doing a dot product here which is this taking these and then it gives me the key which i need and then I select this value by multiplying it with this. So that's basically what's happening. And why we are doing this is because the query comes from the decoding part. So the query basically is asked by the decoder and the, and the keys and values are generated by the encoder side. So the K and V vectors basically come from this connection and the query is produced from this connection. So in a way it's trying to ask a question that is this what this particular thing means? And by taking the dot product and seeing how aligned they are or how uh, close they are in this vector space, we can answer that question using this attention mechanism, which then again boils back to paying attention. So the decoder paying attention to a certain part of the input. So this is what it all translates back to. So okay. this is just, yeah, yeah. So. So in a way, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so if you go back mm -hmm. uh, one slide, mm -hmm. okay, one more. Oh, no, this one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So in a way, mm -hmm. because everything is happening at the same time, mm -hmm. this, is, this is nothing else than a, than a second loss function. Right, right. 
So we, we kind of, so attention mechanism is nothing else that we force a second loss functions in the lower layers during training. Right, right. In, in a way, yes, yes. The, I guess like the dot product being invoked and, and then using this lookup table, we are somehow forcing it to like pay attention to certain parts of the sentence. So, yeah. Yes, but if you say you're forcing it to take part of the sentence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. So, so you you made you made it a minimization problem in there. So you're minimizing the distance in the in the vector space. Right, right, right. Right. So essentially, you have like a you minimize the loss already while training and don't wait mm -hmm. until the forward feed is complete by, by propagation. Right. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, one, one way to look at it, yeah. And I guess that's why you, you, mm -hmm. you could not do that if mm -hmm. you have everything in timestamps. Exactly, exactly. Because, yes, yeah, because yeah, you, could not, yeah. you could not minimize the loss if everything would be in the same time step. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, and sequences like have their own problem because I'm back propagating, we just got back propagation to a time. So that, like I'm back propagating the errors through time steps again. So I'm not having access to all the input at once. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here, like I have access to the entire input as well as the entire output at the same time. And the output can just, and basically the decoder can just choose to look at the input at any given time and select whatever it needs out of that sentence. Okay, so one other idea, isn't it? Um, I mean, what the attention mechanism achieves is kind of similar to what we would achieve with the embedding in the first place, if we do it in steps. Right, like a simple word embedding, you mean? Yeah, exactly. Right, um, so word embedding, yeah. I mean, because we, yeah. because we also try to compress well, okay, we, mm -hmm. we, 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 comp we, we compress it, but we don't care about the relationship between them. So we're not minimizing anything between the vectors. Yeah, now. Okay. yeah, 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 definitely. And like, and word embeddings, like the way to train them and get the embeddings in the first place, like they are used with a shallow uh, neural net, or a simple neural net using like SIBO or continuous yeah. backwards or skip grams. Like, but here, like what we are saying is, yeah, I mean, do that because that's the first step to feed it before the, uh, like even before we begin the transformer part, like we feed that and then we are doing like a bunch of other operations on top of that, like including attention and other things. So it's like taking that context, but then it's also like kind of putting it through all yeah. these transformations. Mm -hmm. It's like putting it through a wash of like, yeah, different chemicals and trying to finally distill something out of it. Okay. So mm -hmm. with this, when you said lookup table, what exactly, how is, how is that implemented? Or what, what's this supposed to? Right, so, so these are also learned. So they are like, they are also parameters. So they are also learned in the encoding step. So basically all three of them are vectors and all three of them correspond. So keys and values are together. Like we need the keys because we want to reference the, uh, the particular value and the main key idea here was that the queries will be raised by the decoder part while it's uh, producing the, while it's processing the output sentence. The queries will come from that and the answers will be given by the, uh, basically the keys and the values, which is, which is going to be encoded from the encoder side. And then when they are mashed together and we take a dot product, it allows us to see like what part the decoder needs to pay attention to. And this again comes back from back propagating errors and so forth because we are again tuning with gradients. But uh, like random initialization, I start my training. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like it just tries to optimize. And then by the end of your like thousand epoch or something, it the decoder has understood that okay, when this particular translated word appears, then it needs to focus on that particular untranslated, like the, the word in the source sentence. So that emerges out of the training. I see. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So that's pretty much this. Uh, this
this slide about keys, values, and queries, and why why we implement this. And this idea actually came from came from what I briefly mentioned called Turing uh, neural Turing machine. So Turing, Turing machine is was is a like a thought experiment. It was hypothesized by uh, Alan Turing, and where he said that if you give him like if if you have an infinite amount of tape, essentially, and uh, you can encode instructions using like holes or uh, like punch cards as, as they did in like uh, old times. So if you have infinite tape, you can run any computation in the world. Now we know that infinite tape is not possible. We are always constrained by storage and memory and so forth. So what this paper tried to do is use this particular addressing scheme in order to store not the di not like uh, not direct information, but a representation of information. So they, that's why they added the neural part to it. So instead of storing images as images, they try to store like a representation of that and then try to retrieve that using this particular addressing scheme. So that's where this idea was born. And the, these authors just, they have happened to apply to this paper. So yeah, so multi-hit uh, multi uh, aspect to the, yeah, the mechanism. So basically then as you can see, the values go in, the keys and the queries, and they are all taken together. We do the dot product as we saw before. And then we do a scale dot product. And this happens each time. So all of them, they, there's an entire stack of different attention layers. So they do this in order to, uh, for every attention layer to learn something different. So first attention layer might learn that, you know, pronouns, for example. The second attention layer might learn, it's kind of like a bank of filters that is used in convolutional networks. Like, so every filter has one particular purpose. So one filter could be uh, trying to find the edges of a human. One filter could be looking at his eyes, say for example. So every every filter has a different purpose. Similarly, every attention layer has, like it tries to learn one particular thing. That's what they mean by multi-head attention. And this, basically what they said is multi-head attention allows the model to jointly attend to information from different representation subspaces at different positions. So this is what they basically meant. And here you can see in the multi-head uh, function, uh, they are just taking queries, queues, and values and concatenating them. So all of this happened and I get my attention vector and then I just concatenate all of them together and I send it to a, a simple feed-forward network. Um, yeah, so this is basically what the multi-head uh, part, part of the architecture looks like. Now, why self-attention? So, yeah, like that's a good question. Why did they go with self-attention? So, one, uh, one like major advantage is that the computational complexity per layer is very small. So, it leaves a very small footprint in terms of like the number of steps needed to reach uh, to the output. Another is the amount of computation that can be parallelized, as we already observed. Like it completely like uh, processes it in parallel, and this thing is actually measured by the minimum number of sequential operations required. So if I'm just requiring two, one sequential operation to like process one token versus if I had the same sentence for an RNN, I would have to have the number of tokens uh, as my number of steps. So, I mean, yeah, we can easily see this is highly efficient in that regard. So the third is the path length between long range dependencies in the network. Now this is one key important factor. So what basically they're saying is long uh, learning long range dependencies is one of the key challenges. And the shorter these paths are between any combination of positions in the input and output sequences, the easier it is to learn long. So instead of thinking um, an entire sentence as like a sentence that I have the last token here and the first token there, and they have a extremely long range dependency you know now instead of trying to um, process it like an RNN what they are trying to do is they are trying to somehow make pathway available between the last and the first token so that at any given time information can flow between the two and by doing that they are creating these shortcuts within the same sentence so it's kind of a recurrence but not in the traditional sense so it's like it's, it can attend to its own uh, body like any element in that particular sentence can attend to any other element at any given time. So this is where the power of self-attention comes into the picture. And here again, you can see, and they also attributed uh, a side benefit, like which is that self-attention could yield more interpretable models, as you can see. Like one of the main complaints about deep learning is how like black boxy it is, and we don't really understand like 
how the weights fit it and you know what exactly are they learning and so forth but here if we can visualize the attention layers this is just visualizing the attention layers so they inspect the attention distributions uh, from the model and present here so basically it's the same sentence both the parts but this particular part that you see is the part that where we are asking the model when it appears in this particular sentence which are the other parts in the same sentence that you attended to the most so when it's appeared here the model straight away, and these are different heads again. So those two different colors actually represent two of these. There are eight of them, but I'm just selecting two, say for example. And so one of the layers straight away went to law, and it makes sense, so it's clearly talking about law, and the other uh, signified application, which is, uh, yeah, it's a reasonable uh, inference there. So as you can see, it makes for very interpretable models. So uh, if, if our model gave certain erroneous uh, predictions on something, um, especially in cases where uh, it's like life-threatening or you know, uh, like safety, uh, safety related uh, domains. So if our model gave some erroneous prediction, we can go back and check these attention heads to see what exactly was act getting activated when this particular uh, you know, instance was getting processed. And by that, we can all, like tune it or you know, we can debug it further as it did. So the, for the training, what they basically did is, as I already mentioned, so the WMT 2014 English to German, which has 4.5 million sentence pairs. So it's a parallel corpus, so source and started sentence. It was encoded with a byte pair encoding. So byte pair encoding is nothing but like similar uh, tokens which appear say for example then he so if i'm encountering then he a lot of times so it takes those two and uh, replaces that the new symbol so the simple just means that he so i'm already reducing the uh, my length of the entire sequence as i'm doing this white parent coding and then again that may be occurring with something else so then i can further encode that so it's like recursively encoding and then i compress uh, my entire uh, yeah like corpus so this has multiple uh, advantages actually because it helps us to like retain some very crucial information but not lose for example doing done did all this can be captured with byte pair encoding and not having to lose uh, yeah like uh, yeah without doing a stemming or lemmatization or something like that similarly Eng english to french has 36 million which is a substantially larger data set and they split it into tokens of 3200 uh, word piece for gap. And for optimization, they used Adam, which has become the standard. So uh, conventional networks always use stochastic gradient descent, but now it's adaptive moment. Uh, so it has like minor tweaks to the classic SGD. So yeah, all the best papers just go for Adam. Then used uh, for regularization, they used residual dropout. So dropout is nothing but randomly dropping uh, units in a layer. So given I have a layer of a neural network and I have neurons in it, so I can randomly choose to turn off some uh, units and with a probability of 0.1 here. So 10% of the neurons would be randomly turned off so that the network does not rely on a few neurons and it memorizes things. So we don't want it to memorize, but rather generalize over the training samples so that it can predict well in the test samples. So with uh, dropout, it allows us to not heavily rely on a few networks. So it just turns a few few of them randomly, so that it's like the the, the activities uh, spread out in a in a much normal manner. So they applied dropout in the residual layer, which is nothing but the skip connections that we saw. And one of the key things that a lot of like uh, good papers do is like they implement variable learning. So generally, what we tend to do is when we train models, we just set it to like uh, 0.001 or something like that. But uh, what actually turns out is that uh, this is another concept called learning rate annealing, I believe. So if we apply some cyclic functions or if we set some step functions to the learning rate or decrease or increase the learning rate as the number of epochs or as the number of training steps increases, then uh, there are certain advantages to that. So what they implemented is this, this particular uh, formula. And it's very simple, what they did is they, uh, this corresponds to increasing the learning rate. So they increase the learning rate as the training goes on for the first warm-up steps. So for a certain number of steps, they increase it linearly. 
and then they start decreasing it proportionally to the inverse square root of the step number. So as more and more steps come in, they slightly start to decrease it. So it's kind of like it goes up and then it starts coming down by this inverse square root of the step number. And then for one step, they use 4,000. So the first 4,000 is straight up and then they start to decrease. Because once the model has been sufficiently trained, uh, like the weights have been sufficiently updated, you can decrease the learning rate because now it's trying to understand more nuanced uh, features of the training set. Like it's trying to understand more features which are not, you know, like it's it's not it's super discriminative, but but it's hard to like yeah, it's like understanding a nose in context of the eyes or something as opposed to a human or a dog. So it's trying to find the nose and eyes of a dog and a, and a human almost in, yeah in that context. And these are the results. Matthias, sorry to jump yeah. in because yeah, we're yeah. running over time. I was just yes. like wondering how, yes, how yes. far um, along you yeah, are. Yeah, it's done. It's done. Just two oh, more okay. slides. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. So this is the evaluation. As you can see, all the previous uh, state of the art. Uh, so this is English to German, English to French. So as you can see, the previous best was 26 here and 41.29. So they improved by two, which is like a big step. And uh, yeah, it was 40. Uh, 1.8 and it's it's not just for trans uh, translation now they have uh, it's generalizable to any any language task basically classification topic modeling whatever uh, task we have at hand if we start with this transformer architecture and pre-train and to get a language model we can basically then do our downstream tasks more uh, effectively and uh, yeah, this is the last slide. So moving beyond text. So this is an interesting idea because as I mentioned, the goal has always been to move away from very specialized architectures. So we have one generalized architecture which can solve vision, language, audio, everything else. So, oh, but OpenAI, which is one of the, uh, like the frontier, it's working at the frontiers of, of deep learning at the moment. So what they did is they made something called OpenGPD. So GPD stands for general pre-training. So it's an image GPD. So basically what they asked the model to do is, so given this incomplete picture that you see here, it asked the model to complete it. So it came up of different interpretation as you can see here. So it's just like a language model where we give it some text and ask it to predict the next word. So instead here we are giving it an image and asking it to predict what might. And this cat example is quite funny actually. Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, it's it's, it's not just on text, but it's getting applied to, to images as well. And uh, yeah, it has long range uh, yeah, advantages. So yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my talk. Hope you found it uh, informative. Thank you. Any questions? Thanks so much, Satya. Um, I just have one question. Yeah. Um, is it like, like is that code available or like mm -hmm. how like just like always right if you think about application you're yeah, like thinking well course. i don't mm -hmm. want to start writing anything like that because i would never be able to anyways <laughs> so i was just right. wondering is the code available by them or yeah, yeah the code is available yeah so the code uh so this research came out of google brain i think yeah the, all the authors are uh, from google brain so they open source it to a tensorflow uh, based library so you can find it I, it's actually in the paper but there's even a better library which is by this uh, uh, new startup called hugging face so they have this emo emo emoji which is the hugging face emoji and that's uh, that's that's their name so they have a brilliant uh, library called transformers uh, so you can check that out okay, cool. yeah thanks yeah no worries cool. So I'll make the slides available. I'll, uh, I guess, share it with you. And then, yeah, just send it to me yeah. or Shani or we will right. put it in the Dropbox right. and online, I think, yes. Okay. <laughs>